my name is Lauren Landry. I'm 16 years old and I wanted to keep the stories alive of small town Gloucester and the businesses that may be gone but won't be forgotten. What you're about to see is a collection of footage that I have put together with a project that is very dear to my heart. So I interviewed Benjamin Lee who owned Lee's Market. Benjamin Lee is my best friend's grandfather and they are just the sweetest family. I was very excited about this opportunity to interview him and to get to know his story a little bit more. There was a house um, up here that I would get the grocers together and drive up there and, and I'd have to raise the window in, in the uh, kitchen, crawl through the window, and put the groceries in the kitchen and put all the cold stuff in the refrigerator. You know, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's the way things were done back then, you know? <laughs> the front entrance was right here, and this was all plate glass across the front here. And our cash registers were right in the front. And my dad's meat department was, was all in the back, and my dad's meat department was the draw. That's what why people came in to our store, because we had the same canned goods as everybody else. It looks like such a small area now, you wouldn't think all that was going on there. Today, I, you know, I still have people come up to me on the street and tell me what a wonderful time they had there and how much they love my father, which uh, is really nice. <laughs> Okay, are we ready? Benjamin E. Lee Jr. and my birth is uh, um, June 6, 1947. Okay, that makes me 76, all right? And uh, we were in the grocery business up until uh, 93. So I was in my mid 40s at that time. Uh, so it, it was, we, I started another business after that. All right. Did you always live in Gloucester? Did. We uh, grew up on the streets right there in, 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 in the courthouse. We had, it was an apartment building where um, the realty uh, office is, Gloucester Realty. There was an apartment building there. It was two-story, and on the front of it was uh, Hodges and Bryant, which was a plumbing and heating place. And we lived in several of those apartments until I was about six and my parents built a house outside of town. Oh, that's neat. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me a little bit uh, about how Lee's Market was established. Ah, that my, it was my father, uh, basically. Um, my father had built up a, a reputation as being a, a good butcher and being able to get things that people want and to you know, have a fair price. Um, when, Dad had an awful lot of people that were loyal to him, and wherever Dad went to work, they would come with him. So um, when he had a chance to buy, uh, buy the business, um, the, all those people came with him. And we had, they were from very rich to very poor. And um, it, it was exciting. Sometimes you know, we'd have Bentleys and Rolls Royces out in front of the store, and you know, and um, it, it was it was really unique to see everybody being able to, in that little store to be able to connect with each other, and, and uh, uh, yeah, it was it was neat. Where was Lee's Market? Um, where was it located? It was right on Main Street, right across the street from the Bank of Gloucester. Okay, and uh, the Bank of Gloucester. Um, was the bank to be with here. That was the original bank, and it was privately owned. It was owned by, um, um, you know, shops. Anyway, uh, so as a family that owned it, and they finally sold it out years later. But uh, it was different then. Uh, when when I was in my late twenties, uh, if I needed a um, I, I needed a new vehicle. I could would just go to one of the dealerships and pick up what I want and write a check for it. And then you'd go to the bank and tell the bank that you wrote a check for so much money. And they would tell you that, you know, we'll put that in your account to cover the check and come in next week to sign the papers. So wow. it's, uh, yeah, times have changed a lot. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> yeah. 
Do you have any memorable um, experiences that you s still can recall with customers after all these oh, years? Oh, numerous ones. Um, some of them were really uh, heartwarming, others weren't. We had one customer that was um, being obstinate, and, uh, and my mother was at the cash register at the time, and, and she finally got him out, and, and it just took a while, and I had a whole lot of people that were trying to get out. And my mother said, well, everybody has some good in them. And there was a minister in the line. He said, don't you believe it? He said, some people aren't any good at all. So to come from a minister, that was really hot shaking. You know, we just yeah. never expected that at all. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, we had we had all kinds of, you know, just uh, 28 years, we, there was a lot going on in, in, that, in that time. Uh, I was away at school when they bought, purchased the store. So when I came home uh, from college, I went to work with them there. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, my parents and I ran the store basically. Uh, we had would use help occasionally during the summer. We would hire young children, to, kids, to teenagers to help us bag groceries and stock and all that sort of stuff. My grandmother would even come and help stock the store. When, yeah. We get uh, we get the freight truck would come in Friday after I mean Wednesday afternoons late and so uh, from six o'clock on we would would have to restock the whole store so we we would have um, some people helping us do that and it was our store was a little bit different from the chains that down the street in that we handled a little better grade of things and. Mm -hmm. And um, at Christmas time in particular, our fruit and vegetables were just, just so pretty compared to, to everybody else's. I mean, they were just, uh, it's unbelievable what we'd have. And we'd sold a lot of produce during Christmas and Thanksgiving and stuff because it was, the quality was high. We, um, our store uh, up until when Carter was in an office and we had that recession, we had the uh, oil embargo came on. We were only allowed to be open 40 hours a week. Oh, wow. And uh, that was like a vacation to us. <laughs> you know? But things changed a lot after that. Um, people changed the way they, they um, bought and what they purchased. 40% um, of our business was probably uh, in imported goods. And we lost all of that. We, that just went, went away altogether. And uh, so we had to uh, adapt and, and change and do different things. Um, being in a, in a small town, you have to, you, you got to remember that you make your living from the people in town or in your community. So you need to, to pay back. You join civic clubs and things like that. And you look out for people that that need your help. Sometimes you, you, you would, in our case, we would feed people that we had no, no idea that they'd ever be able to pay us back. But, you know, it's all part of being in business in a, in a community. And we've lost that um, kind of thing now. We don't yeah. see that much anymore. There are not many small, small businesses anymore. That's true, no. definitely. Yeah. So I know you mentioned previously that this um, was very much a family-oriented mm -hmm. business. So yeah. who exactly in your family was involved? I was my mother, my father, and myself um, because I was an only child. So uh, that was it. We had to depend on each other. And uh, it's difficult to be together, you know, 10, 12, 14 hours a day, every day, you know, except Sunday. We didn't open on Sunday. But, uh, you know, and um, so you had to learn to 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 get along with each other, too, as well as the customer. And you have to remember that when that person, that customer comes in the front door, you have to give them your very best. No matter how bad things are, you have to give them a smile. Mm. You know, and you have to treat them like they're the only customer in the store. And it really makes a huge difference in your clientele. They they will will look out for you. They will they will do things for you that that you wouldn't have if you are cold towards them. 
Right. You know, and um, yeah, uh, you know, we uh, it was it was a pleasure to go go to work most of the time. Sometimes we were just so tired. <laughs> you know, and you you have to you have to get get over that too, you know, because there's long hours and you're on your feet all the time. Mm -hmm. um, one one morning when we were coming to work, um, uh, we found a bank bag laying on the street, and we opened it up and it was full of all this cash in there, and so it had no names, anything on it, and. So we carried it in the store and, and put it put it in a safe place and and a, and the next day this guy came in he was kind of sheepish and he said, "Have y'all by chance found a bank bag?" Oh. <laughs> and we said, "What color was it?" And he told us we got. And he said, "Yes, sir, we have it." So he was some kind of happy to find that bag. Oh, so he, he was in big trouble. I don't know how much. Uh, uh, whether it was you know, he was working for somebody or it was his money or what, but. Yeah, so that worked out really well for everybody. <laughs> yeah. So, what would you say a typical day in the life would be, uh, like as a store owner? Uh, I guess we we got there a little before eight, and uh, we would have to prepare the store. We'd have to freshen everything up, particularly the produce. You have to you have to mm -hmm. keep that looking nice because that's the first thing they see when you come in the store. So it's it's kind of you know, it sets the tone for the rest of the rest of your store. And uh, so that's the big thing and keep things clean. Keep the floors washed and, you know, and keep everything clean. And like I said before, have a smile on your face. And, uh, you know, it, it was neat seeing how people would, would brighten up. We had uh, uh, children, we have, uh, uh, the body type school is just up the street from them and they would, uh, there were classes would come down to go to the fire department and so they could see all the fire trucks and stuff, first graders and second graders, and they would come in the store and each one of the kids could come by the candy rack and pick up a piece of candy <laughs> on the way out, you know, and uh, so I, I don't know, it was, uh, I still have people telling me when they came through uh, one of those school groups how much, how much it meant to them to be able to do that. Uh, they still remember it after all these years. That's yeah. really neat. Yeah, yeah. It, um, you know, it's, we'd have um, we'd have a bake sales out front. You know, churches and things like that. They'd be in front of the store selling cakes and pies and all those sort of stuff. You know, and uh, it it made a difference because we we helped uh, the community again. Mm -hmm. You need to do that. It was nice to to see that people would even come by and help sometime, you know. And another thing in, in a community, small community, uh, when one business is having a hard time of something, another business, even their competition, will send people to each to help each other, you know, and that means a lot in a small community, you know. Uh, yeah, it, it was nice. I think our children, um, uh, caught the tail end of small town where everybody knew my my children all the other merchants looked out for my children the police looked out for my children you know what i mean it was it was a nice way to raise raise children they they knew they were protected and uh, and uh but they also knew they couldn't do much wrong because they couldn't <laughs> get away with it but uh yeah uh, I, th I think it made a big difference uh, in our children. Uh, we had one of our customers say that she wouldn't know what it'd be like to shop with that walker running into her ankles because the children were always in the store running up and down the aisles and walkers and, and things. And uh, so, yeah, <laughs> it's good times, yeah. So can you describe a little bit of what Main Street looked like back then? Or? Oh, in the beginning. Um, yeah, um, it was different. Uh, and uh, they used to have angle parking instead of uh, the way it is now, which you can get a lot more cars in, in parking spaces. And then they changed um, to the way it is now. And that hurt some of the small business because mm -hmm. Uh, one parking space can mean the difference between, you know, having somebody come in your store and not. So um, that that changed things. And the court circle, 
everything is a lot nicer now than it was when we started. <laughs> uh, it's cleaner. Um, at the old Body Tide Hotel, they, they, uh, it was pretty much run down when the county bought it. It was in pretty bad shape. And uh, I think the Body Tide was originally purchased through private money. And uh, they went back and put it back like it was when it was originally built because there was a lot of uh, uh, rooms that were added on to the ends and at the back and, and they were just in pretty bad shape. And so they tore those down and uh, did all the brickwork, put that uh, porch across the front like it was originally. So, yeah, that, that, you know, things like that. And we lost a lot of bu buildings there. And, and uh, uh, the, there was across the street from my store was Morgan's Drug Store. And right next to it was Gray's Drugstore. So they were in competition. Oh. And up the street on the other side of the bank uh, was Wolf's Drugstore. So there were three drugstores in just a few hundred feet of each other. Uh, and back then, back in the 30s, uh, you know, I don't know how they made a living. <laughs> you know, yeah. And um, we had all doctors. We didn't have... Uh, we didn't have ambulance service. When you got hurt, we had you had to go to Riverside Hospital, which is over there where the shipyard is now. And we didn't have the bridge, so you have to get on a ferry. So if you were hurt, you had to wait for the ferry to come before you can get over there. And people don't believe this, but the funeral homes would transport people in their hearses they would put, they would have, be able to, they would put the person on a gurney and roll them in and lock them in the back. And, and usually the doctor would ride over to the hospital with them. Uh, yeah, times have changed a lot. They, uh, that bridge really made a big difference. They built that in 1953. And uh, yeah, that, oh, they had thousands of people down there when, when it opened up. <laughs> You know, yeah, it was quite a feat at the time to build that across there. What um, other changes have you seen in Gloucester, uh, maybe as um, a community or just in general since it's Well, I think one of the things that, that has changed the most is probably the court system. In that years ago when I was coming up and years later, I have... Um, a person did something he shouldn't have done, say he broke, stole something. The sheriff would, would take him or her and go to the people he stole it from, and they would work it out right there, you know, and there wouldn't be any court circuit. You know, we wouldn't have to go to court, you know. And so they took care of a lot of these small things. Uh, then it was it was a whole different way of looking at, at stuff, you know, and... Uh, um, yeah, the court courthouse was right in the court circle, and that brick wall around the court circle was put up by WPA program in, in during the depression in the thirties, and the water and sewer system was also put in at the same time. Uh, WPA was a works program uh, to keep people employed by the federal government uh, because we just that depression had so many people that just couldn't couldn't feed themselves. I mean, it was just different. And uh, so this was a program and it worked very well. We got a lot of things like that, like the water and sewer system done. And they dug that by hand. And this area is clay. And they had to go down seven, eight feet digging these trenches. And I can't imagine how much work that was. You know, of course, if you're trying to feed your family, you will do a lot. So going back to the topic of the store, what, in your words, um, made the store special or the experience special for the customers? That's my dad. Yeah. Um, he he was the draw. This painting was done by a local artist. Her last name is Ray, and she's over in Matthews. And, and she did this painting of my dad uh, on Wednesday afternoon when we unloaded in the truck. And it just... She did such a good job, it looks just like my dad. And at that particular time, you can see Grace Drugstore was next door. And by then, it had changed hands. And uh, it was a cafe at that particular time. We carried it to a print shop. And, 
and we gave it to uh, friends of dad's, you know, special customers and things that uh, they would uh, appreciate it because that looks just like my dad. And I think it meant a lot to to people. I know it does. Uh, uh, all our children have one of these hanging on their wall, you know, just a reminder. Bitsy, uh, oldest daughter, uh, got a driver's license. We were going to buy her a car to drive back and forth to school. And it was uh, we found this $500 Escort that we were going to buy for her to drive back. And my dad, I was telling Dad about it, and he said, I don't know, that's good enough car for her or not. It might break down. And I said, Dad, it's only two miles to school. I mean, you know. And he said, well, let me see what I can do. And he he had every used car salesman in the state, I think, bringing stuff by for him to look at. It never was good enough. So one Saturday morning, my daughter was in the store, and he called her to the back of the store to the meat department. And he reached in the pocket and gave her a blank check. And he said, you go down the street buy you a new car. And I said, who is this guy? I said, this is not the same one I was raised with. You know, <laughs> a $500 car was more than good enough for me. So we teased him a lot about it, you know. <laughs> People came to him and uh, no matter what they want, he would be able to find it for them. And so was, they, we, had, uh, we had a lot of rich families that uh, some of them we never saw at all. They would have the uh, the chef or the butler or one of those come in and do all the shopping, and and they would call and order everything. So we're gonna have a part of this weekend. We need this, this, and this, and Dad would make sure that it was done when he got there. And we handled a little higher grade of of things, particularly our beef. Uh, Dad, we, our wholesale was in Baltimore, and they had a special room there that they would hang uh, my father's beef in and other merchants too for two, three, four weeks at a time, and it would age the meat before it ever came to us. And it made a huge difference in how tender it was, and, and uh, so uh, they don't do that anymore. And it used to come in in hindquarters, which was a hind quarter of beef would weigh 180 pounds, give or take, and a front quarter weighed uh, 225 pounds. And even when I was small, when I was 11 or 12 years old, uh, my dad taught me how to pick those up. So, I, you know, I weigh up, probably didn't weigh 100 pounds, and I could go in the cooler and pick up one of those hind quarters and bring it out and put it on the, on the, on the butcher block. So, yeah. Uh, each thing has this, you know, little things that make a difference that you can do that other people couldn't do. Mm -hmm. What lessons did you take away from that experience? I guess a smile is the biggest thing. I find that my whole life has, has been, it, it make, puts people at ease. And uh, you people uh, would generally do more for you than, than they generally would. Uh, I was, uh, our son was here not long ago and uh, we were having trouble with the uh, cable system and he got on the phone and talked and talked to this person and by the time my son got through, he, they were like best friends, you know, and, uh, you know, so he learned his lesson there too, you know, and uh, yeah, so I think, I wish more people would do that. Uh, it makes it makes a big difference in in what people think of the business, and usually you can tell what the management is like when you first walk into a business. If you if you you know the employees there, the checkout person or whatever is is not smiling and and uh, just gruff, more than likely it's something wrong with the management. It's not the employees because the management sets the the style and the pace, you know, what goes on. Uh, so I think that's the biggest lesson of all. I, this is kind of a fun question, but what are your thoughts on shopping nowadays with the self checkout yeah. and <laughs> online shopping and all that? Yeah, I, I, I get, I, I, I worry about employees more than I am. We, we, we belong to, uh, to the big box stores that handle groceries and everything uh, uh, 
And we particularly like one of them because they treat their employees uh, really well mm -hmm. and the other one doesn't. And you can, as soon as you walk in, in the building, you can feel the difference. And uh, uh, one, one company has, keeps the same employees, you see them over and over and over again. They're there for life. And, uh, but at the other place, you rarely see anybody more than once or twice. So I, I think that makes, makes a big difference. I, I, the, usually when something goes wrong uh, with a business, usually the, the ones that can least afford are the ones that take the blunt of the uh, of the situation with the business closing. Uh, it's not going to hurt the, the, the people that uh, own the stock in them in particular, you know, but the guy that's trying to raise his family, uh, or, the, or the woman, I shouldn't just say guys, but you know, they, they can get, you know, it can hurt them an awful lot. These recessions, uh, this last recession in 07, it put a lot of people out of work that had, did absolutely nothing wrong. Mm. And uh, the people that are in their 50s, 40s and 50s, they lost their job. Their whole, whole life is based on that job. How much they're paying on their mortgage, what kind of house they have, whether their children are going to college, what kind of cars they have, all these things. And if they lose their job, more than likely they're going to lose all that. They go lose their home, and the children won't be able to go to college, and and they didn't do anything wrong, but they still, you know, and they're too old to recover. They don't have enough time left to to recover from that loss. So that that's the ones that are really worth it. You see them um, when you when you go into a big box store somewhere, and you see a guy in there that's a uh, lady that's in their sixties uh, working in there for minimum wage or a little bit better, you know, they in trouble, you know, they, they, they somehow know they've lost the job and they're doing whatever they can to recover, but you can't recover, you know, it's just, it's impossible. So if you're comfortable with sharing this, uh, when and why did the store close? Oh, um, lots of things. Most small businesses, uh, go out of business because there's a larger company that comes in and they can underprice them. And I was thinking about this the other day after we talked. And a wholesaler, what happens is that we were with this particular wholesaler for, for 25 years. And then some of the biggest uh, chains got in, or ordered from the same place. And what they did was they forced the wholesalers to let us go. So we couldn't buy yeah. at the same price that they were buying. We had to pay more for it. And you can't last long like that. Right. It's just, you know, it, it, it's, it's hurtful um, when, when they do that. But it's all, and people get complacent. You know, if you walk into the business every day for like 28 years and things start to, to go down a little bit, you don't notice it. You know, you need to look at it with fresh eyes and keep up with, with the trends and, and keep everything fresh and new. And that's hard to do when you get older. You just right. get, get in the rut and, and stay there. <laughs> uh, were any of your children involved in the store? Rarely. Uh, my children weren't old enough at the time. Uh, to work there. They did some work there, but not much. They, they worked more for me and when I was in the catering business than, than, than they did. They were just too young to do that. And uh, we, we, when we first got married, uh, we owned a little house not far from the store. So uh, after our first one was born, my wife could put baby in the stroller and come up to the store and uh, we'd put the Bay infant seat on the on the counter, so we can, she she could talk to all the customers when they went through it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was nice. We could uh, we I think our customers enjoyed our children. They watched them grow up, and yeah, and, uh, yeah. Uh, I would bring the children to to work with me in the morning, and we would, when they went to body type school, I would walk to the school with them every morning and back. So. Uh, 
uh, we had a special time, and I think that made a difference uh, in father-daughter, father-son relationship. I had, up until then, fathers didn't take much responsibility for children. Right. Now fathers are doing a great job of looking out for their children. Uh, my son and son-in-laws do as much for the children as, as their wives do. So times have changed an awful lot with, when, as far as men are concerned. Um, and that's a good thing. Children need that. They need time with their father. Uh, so I think if men have stepped up, I, they may have been forced into it, but I think they, they did a pretty good job of it. Yeah. So um, I know you mentioned after the store closed, you opened a catering business. Yes, uh, a few months later, uh, we, we opened a catering business, and I was at the catering business for 17 years. So uh, uh, that, that, that really did take a toll on my body, because it's long hours and awful lot of heavy work. We had to load and unload the, the trucks, and we would have a, a big wedding, and we would have 2,000 plates that we'd have to wash and, and seal and put away for the next wedding. And, and silverware and tables and chairs and tents and you know so yeah uh, when I when I I finally couldn't do it much anymore so we had to had to close it just uh, uh, we tried to sell but we it just was impossible. Do you um, still use any of the same recipes from? Oh, like not in large volumes, but we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were uh, in moving. I had uh, a lot of Southern Living uh, books, cookbooks, and uh, I used a lot of those because uh, they're good recipes. They're simple. They uh, you can find all the ingredients at your local grocery store, and and it makes a big difference. Uh, they have some um, bread pudding recipes, and that are just wonderful. I've used those. I don't know how many bread puddings I've made.